If you suffered from racial inequality, if you suffered from gender inequality, you would be completely justified in the fact that you are not achieving the things that other people who didn't have those disadvantages have achieved. And I say this as a white guy who was born in America to a doctor father. But at the same degree, you have the opportunity that Chris nor I have, which is that you can be an inspiration to people who went through the same thing. Because I can promise that there is somebody who has had it worse and has done it better. Alex Almosi, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. My pleasure, man. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is to scrape through people's Twitters that are aphorists and come up with little pithy statements and then break them down. So I want to go through some of the things that I've learned from you over the last year or so, oh. go into those. Oh. And then there's some talking points that I don't think I've heard you speak about before as well. I want to get onto. Amped. Beautiful. So the first one is... So many lives would transform overnight if they realized my life sucks. I have nothing going for me really means I have nothing to lose. And that makes you a very dangerous person. So in any kind of game position, so like in business, right? Every position has advantages and disadvantages. And a lot of people look at the really big guys and they're like, man, they, uh, they, they like, they're, they'll look at me like, must be easy for Alex, right? And I remember when we had uh, Jim Watch and we had a very big company, I would tell the guys who were coming up, I was like, if you're trying to compete against me, I was like, you have advantages. I was like, if you're on a sales call, you're like, listen, you're just a number to Alex. You're never going to talk to Alex, right? Here with me, you're going to get my attention. I'm the one, right? I was like, that's how you're going to throw stones at me. I was like, but on the flip side, if it's me marketing to the masses, I'm going to be like, this kid's in his mom's basement. He has no idea what he's doing. He's been in business for 12 months. And of course he has no idea. Like, wouldn't you want somebody who has thousands of success stories behind it because we've made a system? Like both sides have advantages. And so what happens is people are in this small position where they're more nimble. They can give more personalized attention to people, et cetera. And they see it as a pure disadvantage. And so you can flip the fact that you have nothing going for you with you have nothing to lose. And that means that you can take lots of risks very quickly and end up in the exact same position you are, which is nothing. And so if you eliminate downside, it should decrease your action threshold, meaning you should be able to do more things faster rather than do fewer things because you don't have a great life or things going for you. And so I think if people flip that, a lot more people would take action because they actually realize the advantage of their position. Jack Butcher says you get rich by taking lots of risk with small amounts of money yeah. and you stay rich by taking small amounts of risk with lots of money. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree. I didn't know that was his quote. Uh, he may have repurposed it. There's, yeah. there's something called Churchillian drift. Do you know what that is? No. So it's a, a, a phenomenon. Churchill at the at the core. <laughs> it's no, it, the opposite. It's that um, quotes that weren't said by Churchill often get like erroneously attributed to him. It's oh. like all quotes lead back to Churchill, yeah. even though they didn't. And Socrates. Yeah. It, it's like it's just one of those things. Where it's like I, th I, th I think that Churchill once said that yeah. you get rich by making large amounts. It's like no, he fucking. But there's another one as well uh, that a good friend James Smith talked about which is if you're succeeding at a job that you hate, imagine how good you'd be at a job that you loved. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the same. This person is starting from essentially zero. How much fucking worse can it get? Right. It's the downside. If you can eliminate someone's downside for action, it's like then the bias, it should bias you towards taking action. Why is it that people in that case, if they do have nothing to lose, still feel like they have lots to lose? Because I think most of the times... so. This, I think this is really important, is that they have nothing objectively to lose. And so everything that they feel like they have to lose is purely made up in their mind. It's stories they tell themselves about what other people are going to think about them when those people aren't even thinking about them to begin with, right? But like, that's where they live all of their lives or live out all of the potential downside is in the mere reflection of what other people will think about them in the future should they fail. Mm. And I think that is the, like, if we were, if we were trying to get real and I'm like talking to somebody like, well, I, I mean, cause I know that they, if I actually had somebody in front of me, they'd start squirming, right? If I said the first thing, right? Like you have nothing to lose. And then, cause then they do have something to lose and I just have to name it for them and be like, okay, who's the person in your mind? Who's the voice? It's like, blah, 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 six questions deep. It's my uncle. Okay. Why? Like, let me state it this way. Will your belief that you're going to be viewed as a failure by your uncle be the sole reason that you live the rest of your life below your potential and regret everything that you don't do because of uncle Tom. That's the wrong one. Uncle Harry. <laughs> when you say it like that, all of a sudden they're like, 
I don't want to let uncle Harry have that kind of power. And then all of a sudden it breaks and then they like get free of it. And so I think it's getting really specific and really narrow on the, cause people say it's society, it's other people. It's like, it's usually one or two voices. And if you can get really specific on whose voice it is, then you can name it. And then like, I think I'm a big believer in like shame only exists in the shadows, which is like, once you put it in the light, you look at it and you're like, my mom that was really it. Like when I really think about it, it's because it's not even just my mom. It's my mom in this circumstance. When I come back home for Thanksgiving, I just am so afraid of the comment that she's going to make. It's like, well, what if we confront that? Okay. Your mom, you sit down at Thanksgiving dinner and you haven't made money yet and you quit your job. Now what? Is that better than you spending the next 60 years hating her or resenting her for the fact that she held you back? And then it's like, when you give the real scenario, they're like, well, shit. And then like this weight comes off and they're like, fuck, I guess I should do this. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> Shame on the exists in the shadows it. is nice. Yeah. I like that. And it, it definitely is cleansing to just th- be like, look, here it is out in front of you. Yeah. And it real you realize just how irrational it is. Cause we don't want to look at it Yeah. because it's in the shadow and we put it in the shadows because of how it makes us feel about ourselves in my opinion. Mm. And so it's, it's so scary. We avoid it. We avoid it. We avoid, avoid it. But it's like, I think the faster you can kind of build that muscle of like, huh, I've got this hesitation. What is the real reason? Because like logically you, I can do that whole thing. Cool. You have nothing to lose. You're poor. Great. Zero. <laughs> right. Okay. But then what is it that I'm, that I do have something to lose. It's relational capital. It's status within my tiny micro community. That doesn't matter. But like my perceived status. Okay. Name the names. And, but, but by pulling it out from the shadows, it all, but like that confrontation from here to here is I think where all the fear is because it's embarrassing to be like, it's my mom. The other perfect thing or great realization, I think for anybody that's starting out and is feeling self-conscious about what other people are going to think is when you're starting out by design, there are so few people looking at you that even if you do fail, <laughs> no one fucking sees, right? <laughs> so this is something we realized when we were running nightclubs that we would try and launch a new event around Freshers Week in September. Yeah. And we would we would have this great idea and it would be, everything would be about flamingos or everything would be, it would be a smart night on a Tuesday so people could go out after they've been to sports club or whatever it was. And then it would flop, right? And we do... <laughs> 150 people and all of the guys that work for us would be stood outside looking destitute and upset and they go oh, it's you so embarrassing the tables there so it looks like there's more room oh dude or- we had so many tricks we'd pump the pump the room full of smoke we would pad the back off so that everyone had to go to the front we get the dj to play music all sorts of shit but all of the boys would be like fuck this makes us look so bad everyone's gonna think that we're shit i was like no 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 no, no. Yeah. 150 people are gonna think that we're shit yeah. like the advantage of running a shit business that yeah. doesn't reach many people is that not many people saw your shit business <laughs> yeah. and that's when you're starting out people that are concerned about becoming a content creator i i'm worried about starting a podcast because what if everyone sees how shit my podcast is it's like dude no one's going to see your shit podcast <laughs> it took me three year, three and a half years to get even an appreciable amount of people listening to this yeah. show. And it was effort three times a week. No one cares when you start. So you can be liberated from that as well. And it's just yeah. objection handling, objection handling, objection handling all yeah. the way down. I think a lot of, I think a couple of frames that are just different frames around content making since we're on the topic um, that helped me was one is seeing it as practice rather than the game. So like when we're doing a podcast, if you start, you're like, Hey, we're, I'm going to do a podcast. I'm going to post it's practice for me getting better for future me rather than like, I am like, this is the main game. It's like, no, the game is the whole thing. And this is just like, we're still in preseason. Yep. Like these, these, these scores, these touchdowns don't even matter yet. Right now you can say yet, even though like I can still feel like I'm a preseason, but I think from a mental framework, it actually decreases the stakes associated with doing it. And I think that's been helpful for me, especially it was in the earlier days. The other one was um, kind of the equal opposite of this problem, which is not wanting to start because no one's watching because it feels like you're doing all this work. What's the point? What's the point? And so I actually, the little mental trick that I had was um, one, I track lots of stuff and the more ways you track, the more ways you can win. And so that's a little thing that I found out. So like if you track a hundred stats and you only need one of them to go up, so you feel like you made some progress. So that's like an easy one. And the second thing around the tracking is that I would look at like the biggest possible number. So a lot of times you can see like the impressions of you know, a post that you make, even if you only got like 16 likes, I got like a hundred impressions. And I thought to myself, I was like, well, if there was a a room of a hundred people, I'd be stoked. Like that would be awesome. Especially in the early days. I was like, that would be, I would totally feel like that was worthwhile. And so taking those little impression numbers and pretending that they were like micro events that I was making the work or the content for all of a sudden made it feel worth it for me. And so the combination of 
I can have a small room and I'm really impacting. Like when I get a view that has like 13 views on it, you know, for like a video in the early days, I'd be like, well, shoot, I made this video and 13 people saw it was like a small room. Like that works. But looking at both absolute growth and relative growth. So it's like, okay, well, I went from 10 followers this month to 15 followers this month. It's like, well, you can say that you only gained five followers. I was like, or you can say that you gained by, you went up by 50%. And that was exciting. And so then I, cause I'm a Excel projection guy. I'll like, okay, well, if I do this every month and the team knows this, cause I, I project everything out. I'm like, if we do this, cause I I'll predict where we're going to be in like 12 months and how we usually hit it. Very, really very, but how do you account for the unforeseen 5 million play video that comes in? Well, that's my padding. Right. So okay. we'll, we'll like, I'll project that with no, white swan events, yep, 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 <laughs> you know yep. what I mean, where something good happens. Yep. But it, just if we keep doing what we're currently doing at this trajectory, we compound at 13% a month. Yep. That's what it is right now. So 13% monthly, and that's just on one of the platforms we're on. Um, and so I can just see what we're going to be at six months. Mm. And that's exciting. So James Smith gamifies it in the same way. You know, oh, does he? he? Yeah, absolutely. Exactly the same way. And he always says that it's just like playing uh, levels on a computer game. Yeah. And this month, wow, like I got another XP point or whatever. And I think that's very important because social media and the fact that it is associated with status, even though everybody says, oh, you know, it doesn't really matter and blah, blah. It does. Like, it's very hard for us to remove the human hierarchy from what is evidently just quantified fucking status, yeah. right, on a, on a screen. And what he did was he removed himself a lot uh, existentially yeah. from that by saying, it's not a comment on my worth as a person. <laughs> it's not a comment on whether I'm you know, going to be yeah. loved or accepted by the yeah. world. It's me putting some stuff out. And wow, we won this month. Yeah. And this month, oh, maybe we didn't win. Why didn't we win? Or I'll go back. The same way as if someone beats you at FIFA, unless you're like yeah. a pro FIFA player or whatever. But again, with that, what's the difference between the, yeah. the amateur FIFA player and the pro FIFA player? The pro has put his existential connection right. to his content and the success of it. There's lack of. so many little things on this that I want to go into. One of them is that, so Dr. Kashi is my closest friend. He's like a behavioral, whatever, loves studying why humans do things. Um, and so people who are more successful, a lot of times with their, it's not that they necessarily have more willpower. They find ways to, they find other ways to reward themselves. And so he's like, the more skills you have, the more ways you have to reward yourself. And so somebody who somebody can extend how long their time horizon is because they do gamify it. So people who don't have the skills of figuring out ways to reward themselves in the meantime, can't make it the whole way. But that's like when you're doing cardio and you're like, okay, it's five, th you know, it's five times five to get out of here, right? You, you create micro games within the longer game to keep yourself going. And the thing is, I've seen that across, uh, verticals. So like, if you look at, uh, so Travis Mesh is a Olympic lifter, Olymp Olympic lifting coach, um, out of North Carolina. And he has this really cool way of getting lifters to PR every workout, to have a personal record, every workout. And what he does is he have them map every single set and rep range for every single lift at every weight. And so what happens is all you have to do is go through your book of 200 lifts and every single weight. And you can always find one that you did a year ago. And oh my like, God, well, this is my out. eight rep max PB on good mornings. Yes. And you're like, well, I can hit nine on this or I can <laughs> add five pounds to it. And so every workout they yeah. win. Yeah. And so they get excited because they get rewarded yeah. every workout. And so that's why it's like the more ways you track, the more ways you can win. And then I think that that's those little micro wins can keep you going over the long game that you have to just keep playing. One of the other associated tweets that you did was if your life sucks, the easiest thing is to change your environment. Oh yeah. This is something that I saw moving from a very good life in the UK to now uh, a, as excellent of a life as I can imagine in Austin. Mm -hmm. And I'd met about a million people throughout my time as a club promoter and had a handful of friends. And I was like, fuck, like I, I feel like my people met to friend conversion should be higher than this. I feel like I'm the, the, the funnel is very wide and like the conversions are very low to use your terminology. Yeah. And uh, then moved out to Austin and it's like, I have more friends than people I've met, which is just fucking insane. So definitely changing your environment. What other ways, given that not everybody could move to Austin, what other ways would you say if your life sucks, the easiest thing is to change your environment. What other ways could someone do that? I mean, the environment is, I mean, like, you know, this is a, I'm going to tangent and I'm going to come back. So if you've ever heard somebody say like, man, I hate Cincinnati, Cincinnati sucks, right? Or they go to some city and like, they go there for two days and they make a judgment across the entire city. Right. But it's like, okay, let's go really deep. You ate at three restaurants and you saw seven total people in Cincinnati. Does Cincinnati suck or do the two restaurants that you went to or the seven people that you were with 
not, are they not that cool? Well, it's so easy to just move like two miles down the street. It's the same reason people do staycations. It's like, you don't even need to change cities. You can be in the same city and still change the environment. Like just moving out of your mom's basement, (laughs) you know what I mean? And just going into another place with four guys can change the environment. And so like, that's the, the thing that to me was so telling on this was, uh, so heroin addiction, super addicting, I'll put it that way. Uh, (laughs) and when a bunch of soldiers came back from Vietnam, they had been addicted. I don't know if you've heard of this, right? 25% of soldiers who went to Vietnam tried heroin. It was like an insane statistic. And in the US, 90% of heroin addicts who go to clinics relapse. So they have a 10% long-term success rate. Tough. The stats are completely reversed from people who got addicted or did heroin in Vietnam and then came back to the US, which then you could make the, you could draw the line, which is, it's better to change your environment than to even do anything else. Because what happens is you eliminate all the triggers and cues that are associated with the habit that you're trying to destroy. Do you see that the American government was absolutely concerned that there was going to be an epidemic? Yeah. They were, they were adamant that all of these soldiers were going to come home and it were going to be these veterans that were all addicted to yeah. heroin. Yeah. Wild. And there are, for sure, but proportion, so much proportion less than their quote should be. Yep. Because the problem with the current system of, and like for anyone who's listening, you can still extrapolate the principle or the concept. People are in the environment that they are addicted. They change environments and they go to a clinic. They change the environment. They change their behavior. And then they go back to the same environment and their behavior changes yet again to match the environment. And so it's like, if you want to change your actions, the easiest thing you can do is just change the environment. Because if you can do that, a lot of times, a lot of the negative things you have, you just don't get triggered. You don't get the cue for the behavior. It just gets extinguished. So the way that I've worked this into my home working setup is I think I have six or seven different places that I can work at and I do different tasks at each one of them. So I've got a place I'm writing a book. I've got a place that I write my book. That's first thing in the morning. I've got a place that I do my emails at. That's a recumbent desk bike, which is fucking unbelievable, dude. (laughs) Zone two, 180 minutes a week of zone two cardio, 180 minutes a week of emails with zone two cardio. Uh, The place outside, I've got my studio record inside. We've got two living rooms with different houses that I can go into. And I'm like different spots for each one. And if I'm in this vibe, I'm over here. And if everything's a bit, go for a walk, come back, move somewhere else. I'm like, now I'm in a different mode. Totally. And I, I'm actually, so it works in the equal opposite too. It's if you want to start something, right? So like what we were talking about was extinguishing bad habits by changing the environment, by eliminating the cue. But on the flip side, <clears throat> if you want to start a habit, like for me, one of my quote famous ones is like, I want to put sunscreen on. It's like this, t- it's like one habit that's like 80, 20. Why do you need to put sunscreen on so much? Because, oh not not so much. If I could just, do, if you do like, it's like kind of like walking. Like if you just walk once a day and if like, if everyone just did that, like you add 10 years to everyone's life. It's like, what are the few things? It's like baby aspirin walk. Like if you do that, crushing it uh, from a like uh, skin cancer prevention, A, and then B, just like less wrinkled Alex future. Um, suntan lotion or SPF stuff uh, is like the the 80, 20 of that, right? Instead of having a zillion other things. So it's like, okay, I don't like it. I realize the reason I don't like it is I don't like oil on my hands. Sounds so stupid, but like that's enough punishment for me doing it that I stopped doing it. And so I had to overcome two things. One was that I hate the oil on my hands. And the second is that I don't remember. So I put one thing of sunscreen at each of my watering holes. So I get cued because I see it as soon as I sit down. So I eat lunch at the same table. I work at the same table and I'm on my nightstand. Those are the three places that I spend my time. And so I have one in each of the three places. And then the type of sunscreen I have is that I have one that's dispensed through a thing. So I don't actually have to touch it. So it's like, do I know why? It's like, if you can identify why you don't like doing something, then you can isolate why am I being punished for this behavior and think, okay, is there a way I can fix it? And the other is how can I cue myself on a more regular basis by changing my environment rather than setting an alarm on my phone where if it goes off right now in the middle of a podcast, I'm not going to pull out suntan lotion or I'd have to carry everything with me, which I would never do, right? That would punish me far more than just not putting it on to begin with. And so just thinking through both of those things, anyways, that has been really helpful for me in starting and cueing myself to do new behaviors that I want to do, and then also stopping behaviors that I don't want to do. Very nice. Most distractions come dressed as easy opportunities. Oh, yeah. This is interesting because as people begin to accumulate the success that they say that they want, this becomes an increasingly big problem. Yeah. Um, I think it was Andy Grove who said this. Probably Churchill. Um, <laughs> yes, there we are. Chalk um, another one up for Winston. It might have been Packard. I think it might actually have been Hewlett Packard. It might have been one of those guys. Um, he said that businesses die of indigestion, not starvation. And so 
They overeat. They're not starving. It's the entrepreneur that, and this is like, you get back to human behavior, which almost all roads lead back to it. But the entrepreneurs get reinforced for changing direction because nothing worked, nothing worked, nothing worked. You change that direction, something clicks. And so what happens is you learn a lesson from that. You're like, oh, so if I change direction, good things happen. But that's not the right lesson, which is one of the, my favorite things about entrepreneurship is making sure that we learn the right lesson from the, from, the, from the instance or the circumstance. It's like, I hired a sales guy. He did a bad job. All sales guys suck. Not the right lesson, right? But that's actually something that it, is pervasive in even the internet community of like lessons that people, they'll tell the story and then they'll say the lesson. But sometimes the lesson, all we know is the facts of what happened, not necessarily the thing you took from it. Anyways, um, I was making a point, Churchill, starvation, easy yes. opportunities. So the, the, the higher up in business you get, the more attractive the opportunities that you have to learn to say no to. And this has been really hard for me because at every level, like I thought, great, I, have, I can check the box on distractions. I've learned to say no to $10,000 opportunities. But then when you're, when you're making $100,000, then you have to be able to say no to $100,000 opportunities. And the thing is, is I call it the woman in the red dress. But the woman in the red dress, have you heard this, like, this little analogy I have? No. Okay. So this is like one of my favorite analogies. So in the Matrix, Morpheus takes him through a training program to teach him one thing about agents. And so they're walking down the street and there's all these people going, going. And he says, were you listening to me or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? And he says, look again, he looks back. And the w- woman in the red dress who walked by is an agent pointing a gun in his head. And I see distractions the same way, which is that the better you become, the more attractive the woman in the red dress is. And so you can say no to a six, but what about a seven? What about and a 12? Exactly. What about a hypothetical thousand? Yeah. Right? Like that's, that's really what it becomes because there is no limit on the upside. And so that's why having like some of the soft stuff of like, this is the vision, this is what we're trying to do. And there's a hundred other things I could do, but each of the cost of those things is the one thing that matters most. And I think that one of the things that Layla has been so good at helping me with, and I think a lot of my success earlier on was propelled by the fact that like when I met Layla, I had a chiropractor agency. I had a dental agency. I had five gym locations. I had a gym launch business where we did turnarounds. I had all of those things going on and there was no CEO besides me. I was CEO of all of them because I didn't understand how this stuff worked. And, and I also made no actual, I mean, I made money from all of them, but no income. <laughs> like everything was just enough to break even. And it was nine spinning plates. And it was because like, I was so opportunistic and it's very classic new entrepreneur to just say yes to everything. And Warren Buffett said that the difference between really successful people and the most successful people, this is me paraphrasing, is that the most successful people say no to almost everything. And I've tried to take that because it's so hard. And I think that a lot of the, you know, it's so simple and so hard, which a lot of success habits are, which is like, if you do the same thing for a very long period of time, I think this is Neil, uh, shoot, Shane, ah, I can't remember the name, but I'll, I'll, I'll say that. Yes, yeah, Churchill again. Um, he said, success comes down to doing the obvious thing for an extraordinary period of time without convincing yourself you're smarter than you are. And mm. I just love that quote. Why do you not need to convince yourself that you're smarter than you are because if you're doing the same thing? I think it's because you think you can handle both. And so you're like, oh, I got this. Oh, uh, okay. Because if you did think that you were smarter than you are, you would then start to take on more stuff. So a quote from John Maxwell, which I absolutely adore, that says, you cannot overestimate the unimportance of practically everything. <laughs> <laughs> which is just fucking perfect. <laughs> and it's the cool, it was, so uh, Greg McEwen's Essentialism is one of my top five books of all time. And it's for this precise reason that it's an antidote to the type A fallout, yeah. right? Uh, I can do it all. I will do it all. Watch me suffer and bear this burden. And you go like, look, you can do the hard work thing, right? You can, you can do that. But the working hard and being spread thin are two different dynamics. And one of the, one of the like interesting idea I've been playing around with a little bit recently is periodizing uh, work. So in the same way as your weightlifting coach will have the guys doing his sub max for 90 days he yeah. is building up for 90 days he is comp prep he is blah 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 blah, blah yeah. whatever it is mobility um that's a much easier way to um blend what we're talking about here as maybe a little bit earlier i think you need to specialize more as you get bigger and bigger because the distractions are going to be even greater especially how so so if you are uh the ceo of your company 
and then someone comes in with, you've got so much more downstream from you that if you get distracted, the repercussions, the ramifications of becoming distracted are magnified even more. What do you think about that? Do you agree? I I, I think the the specialist piece is the piece that threw me mm. because I always feel like the, the higher up you go, the more generalist you become. In terms of skill set, but yeah. not in terms of projects or in terms of projects. Specialized in projects, generalized in skills. There we are. Yeah. Yes, I like that. We'll get back to talking to Alex in one second, but first I need to tell you about HubSpot. 28% of some people's weeks are spent reading, deleting, and sorting emails, which means that very much email is not dead. Starting an email newsletter means that you've got direct connection with your audience. It means that you actually own your audience. It is the only way that you can own them without going through a third party like a social media platform. And from HubSpot right now, you can download their free email template that will teach you how to make your own newsletter. You can learn how to build an amazing email newsletter from scratch. They will check out a compiled lookbook of awesome examples from real publications. You can learn what it takes to create a successful email newsletter with exceptional design, unique and compelling copy, clickable calls to action, an excellent user experience, and there is a step-by-step guide about how to get your newsletter launched. So if you You've been thinking, I want to start doing a newsletter. This sounds cool. This sounds like uh, a good way for me to start writing, to build an audience that I can then sell to, or I can then move to other platforms as well. This is a fantastic place to begin. All that you need to do to download this free guide that will take you from no email newsletter to a fantastically designed email newsletter using industry inside information. All that you need to do is head to clickhubspot.com slash modern wisdom. That's clickhubspot.com dot com slash modern wisdom to download your free email template today. The first step to achieving a massive dream is conquering tiny impulses. Yeah. I think it's exactly what we, were, what we were talking about earlier. It's like if you like I I, I got a there's a a tweet that I made. Actually you you were the one who made it go viral, right? Uh, which was... Uh, well, when you quoted me quoting you, David Goggins. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just this endless human centipede of fucking hormosey quotes. Well, it was really Churchill who said it first. It was if we're being, Churchill, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, but it's like, you don't, you, don't, uh, you don't build confidence by shouting affirmations in the mirror, but by stacking... I mean, by Having stacking. an undeniable stack of proof that you are who you say you thank are. Thank you. That's Outwork yourself out. Thank yeah. you there. Yeah. <laughs> I'll quote you to you, <laughs> which is a new, a new low. <laughs> so, so that, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, a lot of people were like, no, but what if you don't have any successes? Like, how do you get started? And I still think that the, the quote is 100% valid. It's that, that they don't realize the validity of the smaller things that they have done up to that point. And so it's being able to transfer your successes of like, okay, like, did you get dressed this morning? Like, did you, did you get in front of the computer? Like you have evidence, it's smaller evidence, but you have enough evidence to make the claim that you can do this. And then you do that enough times that you have enough evidence to make a claim that you can do this and support it. And I think, um, that's where the big outcomes come from. Lots of, of, of constrained, tiny impulses of saying like, you know what, I'm going to get this tiny victory. And I know how to say no to that. I know to say, her- say no to heroin today or whatever. Yep. Um, that would be a hard one, you know, Large, larger, impulse, yeah. <laughs> probably larger, um, but that's the idea is just stacking as many of those pieces of evidence that give you proof that you are who you say you are, that you can, you have done what you say you can do. Mm, yeah. It's uh, the, the challenge of action or belief first is something that I've been playing around with so much. And my friend, James, he wrote a book, uh, the C word, uh, like confidence. It was a book about how to be confident. Right. And um, I do feel like a, a big footnote summary could have been that quote from you. Proof. Uh, and the problem is, this is something that I've seen as well. A good example coming from a world where I was successful in business before I was successful personally. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a skill set now and my capacity within this particular skill set and the performance of what that does are intrinsically linked, right? There's almost a linear relationship mm-hmm. as I become better at networking with guests, with recording, with doing all of the other things, mm-hmm. the show increases. When I ran a business, there were so many degrees of freedom between my inputs to the business Mm -hmm. and the success of the business that someone with uh, like malignant imposter syndrome could always explain away how things had gone well. So I would say, Mm -hmm. oh, it's because we timed the market right. Oh, it was because Mm -hmm. of like this member of staff that we brought in. I mean, I trained him, but really he would have been great without me or whatever. And um, self-doubt can sort of wheedle its way in, Mm -hmm. in very sort of nefarious ways Mm -hmm. when you do that. Um, Then switching to something where you have 
a relatively undeniable stack of proof, even undeniable to the part of you that wants to deny proof, Mm -hmm. right? Which is that imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. After a little while, it's just a crushing weight that you, I call it imposter adaptation. So, Mm -hmm. you know, if you continue to disprove your imposter syndrome in the real world and it persists, you have to admit to yourself that it's got nothing to do with your capabilities and everything to do with your addiction to feeling like an imposter. Mm -hmm. This is just a trend of how you think about the world. You're looking for competent, you have competence without confidence, Mm -hmm. which is a lack of belief and confidence without competence is self-delusion, right? So you need to have this balance between the two. But people, when they say, well, surely self-belief becomes before action. I'm like, well, not particularly, not if that's not your nature. I don't think like you're asking for delusion there. And it is significantly easier for you to think I am a fitness person. If you just went to the gym and did 10 pushups, then I am a fitness person. When I go to the gym tomorrow and do 10 pushups, like where's the show me spit and sawdust. Where's the fucking reality of this? You know, I agree. (laughs) Good. (laughs) Opportunities only look like opportunities in the rearview mirror. Today, they look like risk. How does someone get around this, this um, asymmetry between the fact that in retrospect, it seemed totally obvious. And yet the thing that you're looking at right now, looking forward, you go, that might not be obvious in retrospect again. It's tough because... um a lot of a lot of the big wins, you know, like like Uber's the classic example, right? Like, let's start a business where strangers pick up girls who are sixteen, you know what I mean, and drive them to their friends' houses. Like, that sounds like a terrible idea, right? Like, it just it. But in retrospect, you're like, no, it'll be totally fine because there's going to be a mutual rating system and blah 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 blah, right? Taking out the fact that there are people who've been captured and whatever. Anyway, what we'll, we'll put that to the side, right? Um, and the thing is, is like, just because we're on the investing side, what we found is that there are always reasons to say no to a deal. You can always find reasons to say no, because there's nothing that's risk-free. Even treasuries have risk. The US economy could collapse and treasuries could be worth nothing. Like, And you could create a really compelling argument. Lots of influencers spend a lot of time doing that, right? Um, is it likely? Maybe. I don't know. But it's probably less likely than, than a bank failing. Because if the US fails, all the banks by default are also failing. So which one, you know, which of these is greater risk? So then it gets, then you start comparing risks rather than trying to eliminate risks. And so If we're looking at opportunities, that's why like risk adjusted return is one of the things that a lot of investors look at, which is like, is there a way that I can appropriately adjust this risk to normalize different opportunities? And I think that that single skill set is one of, if not the most important skill sets as an entrepreneur, because fundamentally it's betting. Like that's what we're doing. We're making bets every day. We bet with our time, we bet with our money, um, with the limited constraints we have or limited resources we have against unlimited opportunities. Because that's the hard part is that there is unlimited women in the red dress. Now there's some fours and there's some sixes and there's some eights, but you have to both rate the girl, right? The opportunity. And then also how crazy is she, right? Or whatever, you know, whatever risk factor you want to, you know, associate with this. Is she going to stab me in my sleep? I don't know. Right. Does she have a crazy ex-boyfriend? I don't know about it. I don't know. Right. And so that's why we do the diligence process. But like the, the way that we, cause I just, just tied up this chapter in, in the book that's coming out is when, when we're organizing opportunities that we're going to pursue with a business, we look at what are the ones that we have the absolute highest likelihood of success that we, have, we, we need no new skills and no new effort. If we can do that or the least amount of new effort and no new skills, that would be the first thing we're going to do. And then once we take off all the ones that take basically no effort and no extra skills, we're like, okay, which ones take more effort and still no skills. And then once we do that, then we're like, okay, now we can start learning a new skill. And of the different skills that we could learn, which of these is going to give us the highest leverage as in most output for the least amount of input. And that's pretty much how we tick down which of these opportunities we want to pursue because those have the lowest likelihood of not happening. Does this work in the personal world as well? The totally. someone that is an investor, that isn't in business, that's just thinking about life opportunities. Do I want to learn to salsa dance or code? I think that the investor frame is a is is simply people who have been scored and quantified on their ability to make decisions. And so I think that we can learn a ton from how investors make decisions overall. It's like why why Ray Dalio's book Principles became like a bestseller, even though. of people who are reading the book aren't even investors or definitely not investors at his level. But the principles of good decision making are just quantified. And we have a scoreboard for these guys being excellent decision makers. Whereas most other people, you don't have a a real scoreboard. So we can't tell how valid is their advice. And I think that's what makes uh, taking advice from really world-class investors who've been doing it for decades um, as a great source of information because we can validate that they have a stack of undeniable proof that they are who they say they are.
Very nice. Okay, so this was like Churchill. not Churchill this time. <laughs> so this was this is something that I've actually relied on a little bit myself. Uh, whenever I get to a low point where I think, why do I even bother? I just remind myself, this is where most people stop. And this is why they don't win. And this relates to another one, which is a reminder for the gladiators in the arena who feel beat up and scarred with no hope in sight. Building a business is hard. Hard feels shitty. This is what hard feels like. And this is why most people can't do it. But you can. This is what hard feels like. Mm -hmm. Is so fucking nice to lean on. It yeah. is so nice to lean on. Take me through that okay, low so point stuff. There's actually a story. I'm getting a little goosebumps telling it. So, um... I was way back in my day, um, like you, a party party promoter, but I was in a fraternity. So I was president of the fraternity. This was, yeah. And this was my first semester being president. And so you have a pledge class. You, you get two pledge classes as a president. You get a fall and a spring, and then that's your, your tenure. And then another president comes in. And what we knew, and this will be really interesting for the audience from a human behavior perspective, is that like clockwork, every time we'd start a new pledge class within 14 days, 10 to 14, it was like clockwork. They would all get together and they'd revolt. And they'd say, we don't want to do it anymore. This isn't what we signed up for. This is way fucking harder than we thought it was going to be. Like, we thought we were just going to party with you guys. Like, that's what we expected. Which also shows you how long it takes people to adapt or acclimate to a very a significantly diff more difficult situation, right? I'll tell you what happens after, and then I'll tell you what happened in between. After we have this kind of talk that we had, and I'll tell you how I, how I explained it when I was president, um, all of a sudden, it all vanishes because their expectations of reality have been completely reset. We break reality. Like in the first 10 to 14 days, it's so painful for them because it's such a, a contrast from what, what we they're having just them do? doing. Not the fun stuff. <laughs> but what's not fun? Oh my God. I mean, they can't drink, can't talk to girls. The only people they could talk to are brothers or each other. And we're mean to them. So they could really only talk to each other. And the whole point here is that we're trying to get them close together because it's a bunch of dudes who don't know each other from different parts of the campus. Right. And then we have to get them in eight to 12 weeks to leave as one unit of people who know everything about one another, that trust one another, that know everything about the other people in the house. So it's like, how do you do that? Well, there's only X amount of communication you can have every day. So let's cut out anybody who's not us. Okay. And then if we really want them to be close together, we'll also reinforce that we're mean. But part of what they had to do is they had to learn everything about everyone else in the house. And so every pledge has to do something that would impress a brother. And then they get a signature from their brother being like, I approve of you. And you have to get every single brother's signature by the time you're done. Right. And so that's where each of those side quests become as insane as you might imagine. Right. And there's lots of, you know, there was lots of hazing back in the day, which is not fun. And, you know, a lot of sleepless nights and things like that. And you go from like parting with girls, feeling like you're top of the world, all these brothers feeding you drinks, be like, be like, you're awesome, dude. To then like the next day. And this is literally how it happens. This is how like the break in reality happens. We do this huge party to like launch the new class. And the next morning they all wake up. They're all like, they all sleep at the house. Cause that's one of the, the requirements. And they're all hung over, got their ties, like vomit in the corner, whatever. And we're like, great, clean it up. And they're like, what? Because up to this point, they haven't cleaned after a party. Because all they did is got to party, see the girls, and then leave. But then all of a sudden, they're like mopping vomit in the corner. And they're hung over. And they feel terrible. And they're like, what the fuck? This is what I signed up for, right? So anyways, two weeks of this, they get together. And <laughs> they wanted me to meet them. And this always happens because they want to meet on their, their turf. And I'm like, all right, guys, what's up? And so it's just me. All right. And my vice president and like 25 guys. So there's like a, you know, there's like a size comparison of like just animalistically, there's way more of them than there is of me. And so I just asked them a couple questions. I was like, who here before pledging started was like, I want to be a part of this house. And the guys are like, you know, me. Okay. I'm like, okay, got it. Who here thought it was going to be easy? I'm like, who here thought it would be hard? They raised their hands. I'm like, guys, this is what hard feels like. And all of a sudden, there's just like this big exhale in the room. They're like, expectations get reset. This is normal. You wanted this thing. You expected it to be hard. Reality now matches conditions. So our expectations now match conditions. This is what hard feels like. And then all of a sudden it's like they got permission to feel shitty. And by getting permission to feel shitty, they stop feeling as shitty because they're like, this is just my new world. And so then, you know, you're like, listen, you give eight weeks, you're going to get three and a half years. Other people are going to do, are going to drive you around late at night. Other people are going to clean after you. Like it's a good investment, right? And that it was a good deal. Like you give one semester and you get the rest of them to just do whatever you want. Um, but that concept, like that quote on both of those came from that experience of having someone tell me 
This is what hard feels like. This is where most people stop and this is why they don't win is yeah. also another beautiful uh, bit of motivation. And given that I spent a little bit of time with Goggins and Cam Haynes, yeah. two guys, I was telling you about this before, you said it must be nice as we walked in. <laughs> so Cameron Haynes, bow hunter extraordinaire, lives in Oregon, uh, and he has behind the power rack in his garage where he lifts, he has must be nice written. And I was like, why, why, why have you got that put up on that? Uh, and he was like, it's because everyone says, must be nice to be you, Cam. Must be yeah. nice to be sponsored by Hoyt and all of these like top level bow things and go yeah. on Rogan. He was, uh, there was a video that went super viral of Goggins losing his shit after John Jones won mm -hmm. uh, last weekend. Uh, and the guy that he's hugging is Cam. So it's like, it must be nice for you to be backstage at UFC. It must be nice for this. And I've seen what that guy does. And that guy picks up a rock that weighs about 80 pounds. Yeah. And it's got the word poser written on the front of it because people call him a poser. Yeah. And he carries it up a hill that is maybe like a thousand foot of elevation, mile and a half high with no fanfare at the end, no finish line, doesn't post it on social media unless the team's there filming it with someone else and then carries it back down, puts it in the boot of his Raptor, drives away. And he just does that because he needs to remind himself that he's doing the stuff that is hard. And this is where most people stop and this is why they don't win combined with this is what hard feels like justifies things being hard. Now, I do worry, and I find this in myself sometimes as well, that you can be so good at dealing with suffering that you can actually push yourself a little bit too far. And you go, I'm starting to bear more burden than I can basically take on. And mm -hmm. the art of not burning out is something that I think a lot of people, if, you, if this resonates with you, the art of not burning out is something that you really, really need to be able to feel. And like re realizing what happens when you just start to glance off the bottom side of it and go, okay, like I'm just going to ease off the gas a little. I'd need to take this afternoon to go sauna and, and get some sunshine and chill out and get some food. And then I can put my foot back on maybe a little bit tomorrow and we'll mm -hmm. temper it. Um, but it just, it, it justifies the fact that I use this stat all the time. 90% of podcasts don't make it past episode three. And of the 90%, uh, the 10% that do 90% don't make it past episode 20. So by making 21 podcasts, you are in the top percentile of all podcasters ever yeah. in history. That's what hard feels like. And that's not even hard. It's just yeah. consistent. Fuck yeah. me. It's yeah. less than half a year. Yeah. <laughs> Insane. I hear stats like that and I just think, man, it is so easy to win. Like that. I mean, that, like when I hear that, that's exactly what I think. I'm just like, man, for everyone who's like struggling to win, it's like you, like most of the pain that people experience is purely in their own minds. And so to your point, I think there's an interesting one between like burnout versus hard. And so like, for me, burnout is when my, I would define it as my output per unit of time decreases. So I can see that that's measurable, right? Now, like I can say like number of pages that I edit or the quality of the content that I create, like my output per time, like the team knows when I like, when I'm like six hours, seven hours into recording something, they're like, I literally start like slumping. You're like, like physically, I just start like slumping and I like my, my cadence isn't as like, I'm just not as sharp, right? There's that versus emotional burnout, which I think people mislabel as burnout when really it's just like, they don't know how to reframe reality. And so what it really is, is they got a comment on a post that bugged them. And like, again, it's like pulling it from the shadows. It's like, no, this stuff doesn't work. It's like, hold on. What's the one voice that actually is coming through? What is the real thing? Well, there is this comment. Okay, great. It's embarrassing to even have to say that. But when you say it, then you admit it. And all of a sudden you put it in the light and the shame kind of starts to evaporate because then you can name it and be like, is this comment better than my, bigger than my future? Is this comment bigger than me? And one of the things that I, um, that has helped me was saying like, what's true about this? We'll get back to Alex in one minute, but first I need to tell you about Seed. Seed's DSO1 daily symbiotic is one of the most advanced probiotic and prebiotics on the market. It's a 24 strain broad spectrum probiotic and prebiotic formulated for digestive, gut, immune, and additional system benefits with 53.6 billion AFU. It's a two in one via cap technology. Capsule in capsule protects against stomach acid, digestive enzymes, and bile salts for viability through your digestion. It means that the probiotics will actually make it to the end of the small intestine for delivery, which massively increases how successful this is going to be for you. Altogether, it means that your digestion is going to move more smoothly. So if you've been thinking that you want to make an upgrade to your digestion, you've been considering using some probiotics and prebiotics for a while, Seed is the most advanced option 
on the market. Also, you can get 15% off your first month if you go to seed.com slash modernwisdom and use the code modernwisdom at checkout. That's S-E-E-D dot com slash modernwisdom and modernwisdom at checkout. Are you familiar with Byron Katie? Do you know her? I've heard her name. Yeah, the work. She does the work. Okay. And um, the, the, one of the first questions that she asks you is, uh, is it true? How do you know that it can be true? Yeah. And so it's like the same thing, bringing it from the shadows, right? Yeah. Into the light. Okay. You have this sense. Yeah. There's no shit. It's like a fucking smell. It's like, yeah. I've, maybe something's a bit, maybe something's, maybe I might be like a piece of shit. Maybe I'm not competent. Maybe I'm not whatever. Yeah. You go, okay, let's. And the next one is like, what if we confront it and say like, what if they're right? Now what? Because a lot of, I think a lot of effort gets put into trying to deny, deny reality, right? Like there's this clip that I shared uh, from Tom Billy and he was talking about how he gets made fun of for his ears being big, right? <laughs> and I think it's a really good clip because his point that he was making, because um, it's such a visual, easy example for people to understand. Um, he's like, is that, it's true. I do have big ears. And? And so that's, that's like the, if they're like, you have no right to be making content. Are they right? Okay. And yeah, I'm still going to do it anyways. Because the thing is like, I, one of the things that I had earlier on in my career was like, I didn't think I was a really good person. Like I was like, I'm not a good person. Yeah, like too. some people are like, yeah, I just me had too. that. Right. And I had a history, you know, whatever. And one of the things that gave me a lot of respite or relief from that kind of thought process was like, comma, that's okay. Because I can still do the things that create success and not deserve it and still get it. And that actually felt very powerful for me because it was like, I don't have to deserve to success. I can still just do the stuff that gets it. It's like, you don't have to, you don't have to deserve the girl, but you can still do the things that get her. And do you deserve her when you have her? I don't know. Who knows? I hate the word deserve to begin with. Right. Yes. <laughs> but like that concept, because also I, I could segue into like gratitude around, like, if you think you deserve it, then you don't, you don't enjoy it. But, um, that has been super powerful for me, which is like, what if they're right? And because a lot of people are just trying to, they spend so much effort trying to fight the fact that the comments might be right. This might've been a fucking terrible thumbnail. Yep. You know what? This might've been a boring video. This, this post might've been regurgitated content. This post might've been inspired too closely by someone else's post, right? What if they're right? And yeah. does it make me a piece of shit? What if it does? And you end up getting down to base, which is pretty much nothing. Like, right. All that there is, is actions. All that there is, is what you're going to do in response to this. Yeah. You know what another brilliant uh, ad addition to this that you kind of mentioned, yeah. which is uh, the fact that this is what hard feels like. Yeah. Most people get to this stage and they decide to stop. And now the bar is set so low. Yeah. Goggins said this in the episode with me and it gave me chills when he said it. He was like, it's so easy to be successful nowadays because people are weak. Yeah everybody's weak. Dana White says it as well. Yeah. I tell my kids, it is so easy. If you are even a like weekend savage, yeah. <laughs> you will run these kids over. Yeah. And for every single person, it's giving yeah. me chills again, for every single person that likes to castigate the very padded victimhood mentality of the modern world. Okay, cool. Like you can, you can rail against people that say that the world is against them, even though it's not, and et cetera, et cetera. How does that inform the way that you should operate in the world? Right. Well, okay. What you're saying is everybody else is fallible, weak, fragile in some way or another. Yeah. How does that inform the way that you act? The way that you should act is, holy shit, if I have even a modicum of resilience, right. this makes the market environment for me so much easier. Whether I want to get the girl, buy the house, become successful yeah. in whatever domain I choose to, the bar is set so low. This, uh, if we're going, if we're going tweets, um, this segues into one of my favorite ones, which is, uh, you stay in poverty until you learn the first lesson of poverty, which is two words, my fault. And so when I was younger, I was really angry at my parents, like many people are right. Justified or not, doesn't really matter. I was very angry and I blamed them for the woes of my life. And I realized when I was 19 that these people that I hated, I was giving all the power over the fact that I wasn't the person I wanted to be. And I was like, well, it's their fault. And the idea that I had actually given these people that I hated power over my success 
was ultimately something that made me feel sick to my stomach and was what allowed me to point the finger of blame inwards and say my fault and then at least take ownership over the fact that like, and like, sure, maybe your dad didn't hug you enough or maybe your mom wasn't present or whatever it is, right? It's like, and, and like I said this the other day and it'll probably piss off a lot of your audience. So, you know, we can put our soft earphones on. Um, like if you were, if you, if you suffered from racial inequality, if you suffered from gender inequality, if you suffered from being born in Bangladesh, if you were race, uh, not race, sexually abused your entire life, you would be completely justified in the fact that you are not achieving the things that other people who didn't have those disadvantages have achieved. And I say this as a white guy who was born in America to a doctor father. I understand that. But at the same degree, you have the opportunity that Chris nor I have, which is that you can be an inspiration to people who just, who went through the same thing and succeeded comma, despite those circumstances, because I can promise that there is somebody who has had it worse and has done it better. And I think that that one single point of proof, and like, there's a global point of proof that you can look for, for sure. But like, you can be that very local point of proof in your community or sub community. And I think, um, as soon as we shed that, that's like, I just, I'm a big fan of, uh, power follows the blame finger. So like wherever you point the blame fingers where the power follows. And so it's like, if you point it, if you point it to the government, government has the power. If you point it at your, your spouse and say like, it's their fault that I'm, I'm not in shape. It's their fault. They never let me do anything. It's like, well, you're giving them all the power. Hmm. And so it's like, until you're like, it's my fault. It's also becomes what if it's my not responsibility. Your fault? What is, what if it's not your fault? It doesn't matter. And. Hmm. Like I can't run marathons because I lost my leg at birth and either you can just never try or you put the metal thing on and you do it anyways. So this is one of the themes that I'm very interested in to do with your work in general. And it's one of the reasons why it bridges the gap from what we're going through, which are, you know, some really lovely mm -hmm. philosophical insights sure. and all of the rest of it. Yeah. The difference is you seem to have a knack to be able to drag yourself out of the philosophy and get yourself into action. There's not too much mental masturbation that goes on. So let's say that there's someone who's listening to this podcast, you know, thousands of people that are listening who are that person. Millions. Thousands of people that are that person. Yeah. There'll, be, there'll be a lot of people that are listening. Don't worry. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, that person that goes... I, f I love when I hear these aphorisms and, and sure. things, and maybe it goes on the whiteboard that's on the front of my fridge for a couple of months. How does that person get from mental masturbation yeah. around it to action? That this, this impacts my life in a tangible way that actually makes a difference to me. Any of the things that we go through today. All right. Two things. One is knowing the input-output equation. The second is knowing what your fuel is going to be. So... If you can't define the inputs and outputs that are going to get you what you want, then there's no way to start, right? Because you don't know what you're supposed to do. So you have to define it down to like the most basic first action. So it's like, if I want to start creating content, then it means I have to post something. If it means I have to start doing cold, I always think in terms of business because that's what I'm in. But like, I'm either doing a cold reach out, I'm doing a cold, cold call, cold email, cold DM, whatever that is. I have to make a piece of content. I have to post it. I have to make a podcast. I have to make a YouTube video. I have to make a short, whatever that is, make a blog post. Um, I have to run an ad. Right. I have to, I have to run the ad. I have to press go. I have to spend the money, whatever it is, like whatever that core initial action go to is the, the gym, input. lift the weight, put yeah. the shoes on, get yeah. in the car, whatever the input is, you have to define what the input is. That's going to get you the output you want. Now, once you know what that input output is, the next one is, why aren't you doing it? Right. And so I think a lot of people are looking for something that is very hard to find. And so, and then they attribute their lack of success or lack of action because they don't have passion or motivation. Right. And I was the same way. And so uh, the short story around this was that I, uh, I, I watched all the Ted talks in college. Like that was like what I, I was like, I'm not watching YouTube. I'm watching Ted talks. And I was like, and then I realized, and then I heard the term mental masturbation and I was like, Oh, that's definitely what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, I was like, my life hasn't changed at all. And then I got my job. So out of college and I would read all the self-help books. I read like every night. It's all I did. I just read all these self-help books. And I found one of them that said, there are people who are entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. And I remember hearing that word entrepreneur. And I was like, it made me feel sad. I was like, I don't want to be fucking entrepreneur. I was like, I'm not some bitch. Like, you know, but like, but I, but I was like, but what if they're right? I am a entrepreneur. I'm not an entrepreneur. I want to be one and I'm not. And from that point, it took me six months to quit my job 
to actually decide to do the entrepreneurial thing. And the thing, there are many things that contributed to me being able to leave. And I think a lot of it, it's not like people are looking for one thing. It might be a big bag of whys, a lot of them, right? That add up together to be above your action threshold. And I think in the early days, people are looking for the big carrot. They want the big vision. They want the big passion, but they don't have it. But I want to, I'll give you the first rule of entrepreneurship that I have learned, which is use what you have. And a lot more people have pain. A lot more people have anger. A lot more people have shame. And if you can use that as your gas in the beginning, you'll eventually get to a point where you can get out of that loop and then find something that you are really passionate about. But if you can't tie your shoes, you can't lift the weight, you can't send the DM, then you have to start with whatever you have. And so for me, it was hatred of my current existence. I hated being a entrepreneur. I hated being a wannabe. I hated being one of those people who like talked about all the things they were going to do and didn't do anything. Um, I hated living the life that my dad wanted me to live. I was, I was his bitch. That's what it was. I was his bitch. I was living his dreams out, not mine. And that was, you know, led to that other tweet, which was, um, sometimes your parents dreams have to die in order for yours to live. And for me, I realized that the idea that my father had of me as his son, that image had to die in order for the image of myself that I wanted to be to live because I kept trying to quit my job and go be an entrepreneur. And every time I'd have the conversation, be like, ah, come over, we'll talk about it. We'll have dinner, you know, and he'd always talk me off the ledge. It was always over and over again. Good salesman. Yeah. And, or great authoritarian. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) You don't need to persuade when you have compliance. Um, And so, uh, and so everybody has that person or, or it it might actually be somebody who's talking you off the ledge um, or it might just be a voice in your head. It doesn't really matter because that that voice in person that only happened once or twice probably keeps talking to you when you're at home. Mm. Um, but the big thing for me when I when I decided to make the jump, and mind you, I was such a bitch about it that I, I had to drive across the country before I called him to tell him that I'd left. Yeah, I remember like that. Like I didn't want to, yeah, I didn't want to confront him, um, which he then like flew off the handle about. Um, but I just knew, and this is the Tony Robbins quote, but it's just the, when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. And I think that, I think pain moves people far, far more effectively than pleasure does. Like the easy thing to way to prove it is, like point a gun at someone's head and you have absolute compliance and they will do what they need to do. Right. Automatically. Just like that. Like death is the great motivator and the gun just reminds you. And so I think that if you can create the figurative gun to your head of the pain that you're experiencing, and then I'm a, I'm a big fan of future casting out negative scenarios. So people talk about like positive visualization. I prefer negative visualization, which is what if I keep doing what I'm currently doing for the next 10 years? What will my life look like then? That usually takes my current pain and then just magnifies it. And then that allows me to get my action threshold high enough that it goes over the edge so that I can take that first move. And so if you know what the inputs outputs are of what you need to do, the guy who has the little quote on his wall, and you figure out whatever fuel you've got, not the one you wish you had, but the one you've got, and you use that to do the first input, you've crossed the line. You're in the game. I told a story on the episode that I did with Goggins about uh, bullying in school. Yeah. And this was something where I like opened up about a topic that I haven't spoken about a ton because it made me feel weak and it made me feel vulnerable and so on and so forth. But one of the things that's only really recently happened, and it's actually been assisted by the guy that reached out and messaged me. This dude messaged and, and said that he was sorry for what had happened. His daughter was going to school and it reflect yeah. made him reflect on his time yeah. Um, at, at school and how he treated me. And he was like, dude, I just wanted to say that I'm sorry. I don't even know if you're going to see this. Yeah. I'm happy that you seem to be happy, but you know, I, I just had to get it off my chest. And that really helped. Not that I was carrying much, yeah. but one of the questions, you know, you've spoken about your dad and this kind yeah. of like authoritarian relationship and, yeah. and, and living out that dream. How did you avoid, or how have you got yourself to a stage now where you're no longer driven by a chip on your shoulder? toward him because I think that there are a lot of people that go through challenges in their past yeah. that find fuel in it mm-hmm. and they go wow I, I'm, I can be fueled by hatred yeah. phenomenal totally. I, I can alchemize this toxic thing into something which is useful totally but I would imagine that that has a, a shelf span right that if you keep on using that for long enough there are more optimal ways that you could start to move perpetually under your own motion yeah. transmute it into something else how did you get past having this chip on your shoulder about the relationship that you'd had with your dad and where it had set you back yeah. or forward or whatever? Um, or have you? Yeah, I think I have. 
Um, I think my realization was, you know, first the goal was make as much as my dad, then it was make more than my dad, then it was make more than my dad had ever made. And I realized that the approval that I had, that I sought was always going to be moved, right? Um, I mean, I've told this story before, but um, maybe not to your audience. Uh, but like when I, when I, my dad and I didn't really speak a ton, you know, we text in, you know, two minute phone call, hey, you're alive. Okay, cool. Um, but for that was kind of like for like five ish years um, after I left home uh, to go do the gym thing. And only once gym launch was like printing money. Um, and so we were, I think I was taking home a million and a half a month at like 27 or something like that. And he gave me a call out of the blue and like my dad doesn't like, cold call me. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm sitting at dinner and I, I step outside and he says, um, Hey, you're gonna want to sit down for this. And I was like, okay. He's like, I'm sorry. And I was like, about what? And he was like, everything. And I remember in the moment actually feeling nothing and thinking that was curious and then being like, huh? Okay. And I probably should have just like accepted it for the olive branch that he was probably trying to like lean out to me. Um, but here's what I said instead. <laughs> I said, you know how people get up on stage when they win the awards and they're like, I just want to thank my mom and dad for always being there, always believing in me. I was like, I'm not going to say that. I was like, cause you weren't and you didn't believe in me. And right after that, he was like, well, we'll see how long it lasts. And so It was after that phone call that I realized that everything that I'd done to that point was to try and beat him at his game because everything my dad cared about and not everything, he's a good guy. Like, you know, we're fine now. But like when I was growing up and it's fairly common in most foreign families to be very like money driven. And I always knew that kind of subconsciously and he would never say this, but like I felt it because whenever he introduced somebody, he'd tell me how much they made immediately. He'd be like, this is John. John makes this. Like, this is Bob. He makes this. Like, it was just, it was just like the worth and the name was like immediately tied together. And so I realized that I was trying to win his game rather than playing my game. And I think when that happened, it was the same instance of kind of like the blame finger, but just at a different level of saying like, okay, well, I don't blame my dad anymore, but I'm still playing his game. And so I'm winning, not my game, I'm winning someone else's. And so I think when I was like, okay, well then I have to define the game and the meaning of the game that I want to play. I have more responsibility now because I have to define the rules of what matters most to me, et cetera. Um, but that was where I feel like I got, and maybe there's more that I'll unpack later, but that was kind of the next level, at least for my awareness of how I perceived what I was going after. Do you remember you, I think you spoke about people that break the law in an attempt to make money. Uh -huh. And you said, uh, we sacrifice the thing we want for the thing that's supposed to get it. So we sacrifice uh, freedom for money in the hopes that the money will give us freedom. Yeah. Downstream from that, this is one of the best things that I learned for all of last year. And you created the framework and then I filled it in. So I talked about the tension between uh, success and a desire to feel like we're enough. Mm -hmm. I think that this speaks to what you're on about here. Success is a strange thing. Presumably we want success because we think a more successful life will bring us more happiness, meaning and fulfillment. Here's the problem. We sacrifice the thing we want, happiness, for the thing which is supposed to get it, success. Yeah. Failure can make you miserable, but I'm not sure that success will make you happy. And if you end up with an equation, if you could imagine like we sacrifice happiness to achieve success in the pursuit of happiness, yeah. like if you just remove success from both sides of the equation, what are you left with? It's yeah. just happiness. Equals now, happiness. There are, um, we can't deny the fact that we're statusful beings, yeah. that we, you know, we require external validation. We can't just, you know, go and live in a cave and in peaceful yeah. bliss and all the rest of it. Like there are things that we need to do, but I do feel like a lot of the time we overclock our lives with regards to success and the yeah. pursuits that we go through in an attempt to, to do this. And that uh, we sacrifice the thing we want for the thing which is supposed to get it is like, I see that all the time. I always ask myself, am I overcomplicating this? Like, am I, am I doing more than I need to do? Is there a simpler way to do this? Mm-hmm. I think, um, I mean, I think this is a, actually a, a game theory thing. Um, and you're familiar. Okay. So <laughs> I can, I can, I can go on it or I can not if you want. Okay. Bring it on, bring it on. Yeah. So, I mean, si Simon Sinek popularized this, but you have finite and infinite games, right? Finite games where you have no, known players, agreed upon rules, um, and an outcome that, that wins the game. Right. Uh, and then infinite game, you have known and unknown players, no rules. And the point of the game is to keep the game going. And what happens is that people apply finite rules to infinite games and then they wonder why it's not working. 
What's and an example? So a fine game would be like baseball. You know the players at the end of the game, the person you tally up the ones with the most runs and you win. And there's you can't you can't run you can't hold the ball and run it around the bases like there's rules of play. With an infinite game, the Vietnam War isn't a simple example that Simon Sinek gives, which is basically the U.S. lost the Vietnam War because they were they were applying a finite structure, which is we're going to win this war, and the Vietnamese people were we're playing an infinite game structure, which is we're going to stay alive and keep fighting. And as long as someone is staying alive and keeping fighting, they will beat the person who's trying to end something. And so the infinite frame always conquers the finite. And the thing is, is that most of the games worth playing are infinite. And so if you were trying to get in shape, you don't win getting in shape. The point is to stay in shape for the rest of your life. You don't win at marriage. The point is to stay married. You don't win at business. The point is to stay in business and keep doing business. And so the point of the game is to keep playing. And I think if if the six, and I would imagine success, if you put all of those things together, it's an infinite game. And so the point of success is to do the things that make you successful. And so if you're doing the things that are making you successful, then you are by definition winning. Mm. And I think that for me, redefining what is a perfect day and living as many of those days in a row as I possibly can, to me, that's winning. And I, and I obviously have a relatively contrarian worldview, but which is that like when we die, nothing happens. And, you know, we know what it was like uh, to die because we've all been dead before, which is when we were, before we were alive. Um, but I don't think that what I will do will ultimately matter in 500 million years. And so that kind of eliminates a lot of the pressure for me around like the external outcome. Sure. I'm human. There are definitely motivators, but if I can just over time chip away at how much that weighs on the scale and I can keep putting more and more coins on the other side (coughs) towards the infinite game of like the point of the game is to keep playing. And like, there are some things that I remind myself over and over again. It's like the point of the game is to keep playing. That's the point. That is the point is to just keep playing. The point of the game is to keep playing. I very much like that. What was that? You found out um, the three trait, the three most common traits of highly successful people. Do you remember yeah. those? Yeah, it was, um, <laughs> it's, it's so funny. A superiority complex. So the three most common traits of hyper successful people that they looked at. And it was interesting because there's the influencer world wants to be like, you have to wake up at five or you have to do cold plungers or whatever the fuck. Right. But the thing that, that, but there was actually very few that they all had in common. So number one was that they had a superiority complex. They thought they were better than other people and that they deserved more. The second is that they suffered from massive insecurity and feeling that they would never be enough. And third, they had impulse control. And so you've got this combination of people who are like, I want to do this big thing. So this big toward thing. And they've got this big away pain that's like, I'm never going to be enough. I always have to do more. And then they have impulse control that keeps them focused on the goal without seeing the woman in the red dress or getting pursued by her. And that like, so it's like shoot high, have a big thing that, that motivate, like have a big tiger behind you and stay on the path. Have you ever heard uh, Jordan Peterson talk about that study of starving rats in a tube with a spring attached to their No. Tail? Fucking brilliant. This is, this is what you're talking about. So um, starving rats are placed into a tube yeah. and they have a spring that is attached to their tail that can measure the force that they pull out yeah. and that's a proxy for desire. Then they waft the smell of cheese in from the front of the tube and the rat pulls and they measure how hard yeah. they want to go. And you think these rats are starving, they would be pulling pretty hard. Then they do another iteration of the study. This time they waft the smell of cheese in from the front, but they waft the smell of a cat in from behind and the rats pull harder. Yeah. And what's the lesson that you not only need to run towards something that you want, but you need to run away from something that you fear. Now the problem, and this is, I I like superiority complex, crippling insecurity, impulse control. I like that. The problem is the people who we admire the most due to the most success in the real world, don't necessarily have the most admirable internal states. That to me isn't necessarily the most peaceful, blissful way to live your life. Mm -hmm. What does it say that, especially in the modern world, we uh, revere the people who have external accolades of success Mm -hmm. and yet the three most common traits of these super successful people lead from a place which is almost objectively miserable? (laughs) <laughs> unadmirable yeah how yeah. do we how do we square this circle i think it's just what are we solving for so um like i mean a lot of people i love watching last dance which is michael jordan's you know mini docuseries phenomenal yeah unbelievable um i think most people could see him there and be like i don't know if i really envy this guy's life like he still seems like pretty upset despite being a billionaire despite all these you know these these, these other things and so i think that if like what are we solving for? Like my, my closest friend, Dr. Kashi, he has a statement because he coached Olympic, uh, Olympic teams. And he was like, champions are broken. 
I was like, huh. He's like, they, people look at champions and try and find something that that champion has that they don't have. And he's like, but it's not that at all. He's like, they lack something everyone else has, which is an off button. They just don't stop. And at the end of the day, like if we're, if we're optimizing for outcomes, then the most broken person will win. The person who has the absolute biggest, you know, desire for achievement, the absolute biggest fear or pain that they're running away from and the hardest impulse control. Now impulse control, most people would agree is a good thing. The other two, not as much. And so what are we optimizing for? What problem are we solving? It's my favorite. It's probably the number one most frequently asked question that I ask to our portfolio companies whenever we're about to do anything, which is what problem are we solving? If the problem that we're solving is that I want to be content, well, there's a lot of ways to do that. And you don't need to do all these other things. If the problem you're solving is that you want to be the richest man in the world, well, you're going to have to have a lot of superiority complex. You're going to have a lot of crippling insecurity and you're going to have a lot of impulse control and you have to wait a long time. There's a quote from Jason Pargan that says, accept that all of your heroes are full of shit. Your heroes aren't gods. They're just regular people who probably got good at one thing by neglecting literally everything else. Yeah. I just, I agree with the statement. Fucking money. Um, I, I, it's just so interesting to me. I've been thinking about this to do with uh, Billy McFarland. Uh, let, me, let me just get this in. Hit it. And that's okay. Because if they wanted that, then that's the problem that they're solving for. Like I get criticized all the time for work-life balance. People are like, well, you don't have any hobbies, Alex, and you don't whatever, right? And I'm like, I don't fucking want any. So why do I have to sacrifice things that I would prefer to do to do things I don't want to do to satisfy your objective measure of what you deem as work-life balance? Why? So that's what, what this is where you were talking about. Uh, was it optimized for the outcome or uh, what's the metric of success? Uh, yeah. That you were saying like, what, what is it that people are optimizing for? Right. right. It seems to me that you have stepped back and decided axiomatically, this is the thing that I'm optimizing for. That I enjoy most doing. Yes. That's I enjoy playing the game. And so everything I do is about the game. Yes. My podcast is called The Game. I draw pictures all day about business. I write books about business. I make content about business. And I spend the rest of my draw? time. I've never seen a picture. Oh, from dude, 100 million you. offers. A zillion pictures in there. Oh, yeah. are they done by you? 100%. All of the drawings are mine. And 100 million leads has like 100 doodles in it. Yeah. Isn't it? Oh, yeah. Are you any good? Are they nice? I think so. Are they, got, are they cute? Yeah. They've got little animals in? Yeah. If they don't have animals in, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to look at them. Oh, there's there's little bag of money, big bag of money. Like that's how. Nice. I'm dead serious. Sweet. But no, but like, and, and I spend the rest of my day doing business. And so it's like, well, why don't you garden? Because I don't care. <laughs> here's, the other, here's the other thing, right? I, I, I always talk about this. Steffi Graf, um, they, one of the greatest female tennis players of all time. Yeah. And she gets tested when she's 10 years old, 11 years old, and she's in some tennis academy. And they gauge the players on two criteria. Uh -huh. They gauge them on desire to train uh, and skill set. All right. And she was 10 out of 10 on both. Mm -hmm. So, okay, not only has she got the raw materials to make a phenomenal tennis player, but she'll outwork you and to her, it won't even feel like work. That's fucking terrifying. Yeah. And that's why I do think for the people that look at yourself and say, uh, Alex is on a, a road to burnout. It's because you are using your theory of yeah. mind about how you would feel if you had to work as much as you do. Yes. But okay, what is the thing that you can do longer than anybody else? And to them, it looks like work. And to you, it looks like play or feels like play. What would that be? Oh, well, for me, it would be uh, computer games or knitting or rock music or whatever yeah, do it is. That. It's like, okay, so imagine <laughs> if you just got to do that all day, yeah. but instead of it being rock music, it was fucking business. Yeah. Uh, someone commented the other day, um, was it you're sprinting on a treadmill? Uh, they were concerned that the pace that the show is going out at was going to cause me to burn out. And in retrospect, I'm, you know, in five years time, I'm like, oh, fuck yeah, I was moving too quick. But I don't, th I don't think that like I work at the pace that I like to work at. And I also like to see where those limits are. And that's exciting to me to go, okay, just how much harder can I go here? And then again, you, you've got to temper it with that's burnout. Like that's just the beginning of it. And you yeah. only know that after you've burned out like uh, yeah. 30 times, uh, but that's, it's tried to say after Atomic Habits by James Clear, right? But the intersection of like what you love to do, what you're good at and what you can be paid for is yeah. like slap bang in the middle of it. Slaves worked all the hours they were awake for their entire lives. In American history, in Egyptian history, in the rest of the world that had slaves, which is most of the world at some, some given point. I think like if they can do it, so can I. Now you're like, well... Did they have a happy existence? Well, they didn't get to pick the work they did, but it means that you can work. That's if you have the cap behind you. You can work every hour of the day. I'm like, well, if you get 
to have the cheese and you get to eat the cheese the whole way you're going, then, I mean, there's the famous quote, uh, you know, the person who, the person who loves walking walks further than the person who loves the destination. Right. And so like, I think it's the same thing, but the, everyone, so many people want to project their idea of, of what they think your life should be like onto you. And it's just completely irrelevant. It just doesn't matter. Like if all I did, if I, if I weren't married, right. Cause people were like, okay, well he is married and like I am in shape, but I also just like working out. But if I didn't have either of those things and all I did was work all day, more people would talk about the work-life balance thing for me than they currently do. And who cares? I just like, I just, I fundamentally am like, you are going to die and you're not going to matter and I'm going to die and I'm not going to matter. So why do I care about what you're going to say when you're not even going to show up to my funeral? Who gives a shit? In other news, there has never been a better time to start an online side hustle and hosting it is making creating a website as easy as possible. If you're looking to start your own website or online shop but don't have the technical or design skills, you can look no further than hosting it. With hosting it, you can launch your own website or online shop in minutes and thrive online. For $2.99 a month, hosting it provides an all-in-one website builder, domain, hosting, and professional email service. It's the most affordable option for getting your online hustle started, and it's ridiculously simple to use. With hosting it, you can launch a WordPress website in just one click or use their drag and drop website builder. Plus, you can choose from over 150 beautiful and fully customized templates for e-commerce, blogs, portfolios, landing pages, and more. If you need a logo, Hostinger has got you covered with their AI logo maker powered by ChatGPT's API. You can create a logo in seconds and make your brand stand out. Head to hostinger.com slash modernwisdom for an extra 10% off if you use the code modern wisdom at checkout, that's H O S T I N G E R dot com slash modern wisdom and modern wisdom at checkout. What is it that you're taking an enjoyment from then? The one step deeper than this, there is something that you're optimizing for. Oh, I love, I love the reward. What reward? The micro rewards I get every day. Like of operating a business. Of all things business related. Yep. So I love writing the book about business. I love talking to my editor about what we're changing. Oh, that's a really way better way to say it, right? Or I like tweeting about the thoughts that we have. I love doing discussions like this because I talk about my favorite topic, which is business <laughs> for the most part. Um, like, And I actually am pretty averse to punishment. I've learned that about me. Like, I do not like it. And when I say punishment in the formal sense, like things you don't like. Right. And so like I avoid them like the plague. I don't do them. And so I just do as many of the things I can that reward me as frequently as possible. But from the outside to a lot of people, that looks like punishment. Right. Yes. Interesting. How can someone uh, cut through societal expectations, the ways they've dealt with past trauma, expectations from parents, all of the things that aren't their thing? Yeah. How can somebody, because what you've done, again, axiomatically, a priori, this is the thing. I want to optimize for. How do people find the thing that they want to optimize for? I don't have a thing. Alex, yeah. that's fucking great for you with your business. It just happens to be something else that's at the intersection of making a shit ton of money. Yeah. How do I find it? And I was thing? lucky with yes. that. Yes. That yes. that just happened to be the intersection. Because if I love knitting and I didn't like business, yes. that's a whole separate, because like you can turn knitting into a business, but like yep. if I only like knitting, then there's a way to make a living from that. But to, to, to get to the person who's like, uh, how do I find my thing? Um, I'm a big fan of being directionally correct rather than absolutely correct. And so I think what happens is most people are trying to find the perfect answer when they have no perspective from which to make a judgment. They're trying to find the perfect thing to do when they haven't done anything. So how would you have perspective to make a judgment? Like if you try a lot of things in the beginning, which you have to know what your inputs outputs are, decrease your action threshold enough with either a cheese or a cat, whatever you need. Most people have more cats than they have cheese in the beginning. So use the cat to start running towards something. And the thing is, is, the rat, it's so simple. It's like there's cheese here. But what you really just need to know is that there's cheese out there. And there's a cat behind me for sure. And so if I just go anywhere away from the cat, I will have a higher likelihood of getting closer to the cheese. Not that I will find it, but I will get closer to it. And I think it's, and I've lived my life through a series of rapid iterations, not trying to pick the right thing. Because I just like, even when I started my first business, I, I was between frozen yogurt, test prep, and a gym. Those are the three businesses that I was, I was choosing between. Makes complete sense, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot of things that I like, right? You know? <laughs> and so, so I was choosing between those things. And like, why were those the things? I was like, well, I was pretty good at taking tests in college. So I get that. I like frozen yogurt. <laughs> and I, I mean, it sounds simple, but like, I was like, everybody likes something, 
right? And I actually didn't know that I was gonna like business. That's the crazy thing. Cause also, A, when you and I were younger, Instagram wasn't there, YouTube, like none of this shit existed and entrepreneurship wasn't cool yet. And so I just hated my job a lot and I hated where I lived a lot. And so I was like, well, I will just not be here. So cat, don't know what city I'm gonna go to, but just not this city. Yep. I went across the furthest place from Baltimore, which is California. And then I was like, okay, well, what do I hate doing? Well, let me not do that, which is, you know, sitting on meetings all day and doing whatever, you know, doing grunt work for shit that I felt like was meaningless. And instead I was like, I'll do fitness because I like fitness. And I was like, at the very least, I'll do something I enjoy, which I liked fitness at the time. And if you're like, well, I don't like doing anything. Well, it's like, well, then that's impossible because your brain is wired to be rewarded for things. And so you are doing things that reward you. That's why you do them. Like everything we do is because we've been rewarded for doing things like that in the past. And we project the same activities and we predict that the doing things like we did in the past that reward us, will reward us again in the future. That's where our behavior comes from. And so it's like, okay, well, what has rewarded you in the past? Where's the cat? Go the opposite way. Yeah. So uh, the reverse role model is something similar, but you're, you're almost taking this into a lifestyle perspective. So the rever reverse role model is if you live in a town or you grow up somewhere and there's no one around you like the sort of person that you want to be like, but there are tons of people like the person you don't want to be like, you can say, there's a way marker. I don't want his relationship with gambling. I don't want the way that he handles his finances. I don't want the way that him and his wife communicate with each other. It's like, okay, there we go. Warren Buffett or uh, Munger says uh, like an amazing amount of success has been achieved by not trying to be smart, but avoiding being stupid. Uh, so there's your way markers there. But what you're saying is that this is almost like a, a, a abstracted lifestyle version of this. These are all of the things that I hate to do. What's the opposite of that? Yeah. And the uh, challenge of, I don't know precisely what the exact thing is, therefore I can't move toward it, is one of mine, which is perfectionism is procrastination masquerading as quality control. I was going to say it was a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fallacy. It's a, it's a decision-making fallacy. It's the same. It's, this is why investor frames can be so useful. Like if you're looking for the perfect investment, you won't find one. There's always downsides. Every, every investment has risk, right? And so using that frame, you're like, well, there's all these paths. Which one do I choose? It's like, well, you have to, the one thing that's guaranteed is if you keep the money, it will go down in value because it'll inflate, right? So not investing is the only way guaranteed to not get a return on your investment. Is that a, the fact that inflation exists, do you think that's a useful motivating force for business people? You know, you could imagine a, a different form of world economics where, you know, like embedded growth obligations weren't there and like whatever, you know, inflation didn't happen. Do you think that that sort of motivates people to actually be like, oh, fuck, like I need to, I need to do something with this money. I can't just sit, sit and leave it in the bank. I think it would motivate investors. Yes. More. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the, the business people would just like probably keep more coins in their, in their vault and just keep transacting. Who's that Scrooge like, McDuck? Yeah. They'd be less likely to they'd be less likely to deploy capital faster. Because mm. if you feel like there's a cost of capital that's higher for keeping it, like letting it sit there, then you have a higher urgency to do something with it. If you have less urgency, then you only do it when you know it's going to crash. You gain nothing from underestimating your opponent. Mm -hmm. How does this relate to your world? So a lot of the tweets that I have actually come from conversations I have with our portfolio CEOs. And so they'll say something, right? Um, and they're like, oh, we're way better than those guys. And I think somebody said like something like that on a meeting. And I just thought about it and I was like, what a stupid thing to say. I was like, you gain nothing from that statement. I was like, you literally gain, like, what do you gain from that? You gain complacency, right? You, you, incre you increase the likelihood of looking stupid in the case that they do crush you, right? I was like, because on the flip side, like how many upset, like the only things that upset the guys who are on the top of the mountain is hubris. Like there's really no reason that the guy on the top of the mountain should ever lose. He has the most resources. He has the most, he has the, mo the highest perspective. He has the most vision. Like he has everything. He has all the food at the top of the mountain. And yet history shows us humans act like humans. And so we lose because of our egos and because it, it hurts to say, what if that person's better than me? And so I think that if you, it, it actually is, is really uh, parallel with a, a different uh, tweet that, that kind of took off, which was people underestimate how much smarter you can seem if you have 20 minutes of preparation. Yeah, that did, that's so fucking true. Right. Yeah, and so like people get into businesses and like, well, what if you actually had to face this team? People were like, well, I don't want to practice. It's like, why not? Like, why wouldn't you practice? Like for a lot of fighters show up not having prep for the fight, not really hard. I'm like, what do you gain from that? Because if you practice really hard, you get better. 
period. And like all it is, is purely an ego play. The only, the only win you get from not prepping and showing up to the fight is that you appear to be more naturally gifted. And I would rather be known for my work ethic than my natural gift as an aside, but you appear to be more naturally gifted. And then you win by less than you would if you prepared, you gain nothing. And so it's purely an ego thing, but you, you, we do it all the time. And so I wanted to like my, my Twitter stream is just thoughts to self. I deleted it because I didn't have enough room in my profile to say it, but it was originally like notes to self. <laughs> and it's just like to remind me of things as they come up because I fall into that trap too. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna, we're going to outperform this guy or like this company is going to crush it. I'm like, but we don't gain anything from that. It's like, so we just have to assume that we're always the underdog and then they've got a trick up their sleeve that we don't know about. It's like, that's the whole, the only the paranoid survive. Mm. A reverse of that or something that's interesting to do with people at the top of the pyramid is there's only one way I know to beat people who copy you, get bigger. It's not by direct conflict, but by making them shrink into irrelevance by comparison. Mm-hmm. Agree. <laughs> I just, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Be, I mean, especially when it comes yeah. to content creation, I imagine that this is something that, totally. you, yeah, that, you know, you see one thing that becomes effective and then downstream from that, a lot of stuff happens. Yeah. And, you know, if you've done the hard work of forging ahead, trailblazing, pathfinding, split testing, f- wow, we finally came up with this yeah. thing. And then within four weeks, you're like, oh, brilliant. This is yeah. all over the internet now. Well, I always see it as like a, a first mover thing, which is like, they need me. I don't need them. Yeah. They require me in order to iterate their content. I don't because I don't look at theirs to make mine. Yep. And so, and it's because like mine Everybody is, knows, man, as well. Everybody knows. Oh. <laughs> Every single person that's copying thumbnails, that's copying subtitle, subtitle styles, that's, you know, going after the same talking points. Right. They know deep down that what they're doing is creating a rough hewn pixelated equivalent of what they think they can try and be at, at best what you can hope for is being the second best Alex Homozy in the world. Right. And I'll win that game, but like they would beat me at being whoever they are. Correct. I mean, it sounds so trite, but like I, I want, I'm trying to say this in a different way so that it hits because like people have heard like, there's only one version of you. Like there's just so much actual meat to that concept because this is, this is, you know, Gary originally did the document don't create thing. And I think that the the reason that the content that we have is quote original is because like we document, I, I document through Twitter, the things that come up in my actual life. And so it's not like what's trending right now. It's yeah. like, well, I had this meeting with a CEO and he fucking said that thing about the competitor and that's my tweet. And there wasn't somebody else in the meeting also going, oh, brilliant. That's a lesson that I can take that I can use for my Twitter. <laughs> right. And so it's all from like original source. And if everyone else, like, and this is on the flip side, if you're the person who's doing this, like you need to find what your original source is of content, because like you will always be second or second. You'll never be first is really the, is really the statement. And like, at least for me, if I'm playing a game, I want to play for the long haul. And the point of the game is to keep the game going. And if you want to keep the game going, then you can't be dependent on someone else. There was another one that I thought was quite interesting, especially given the kind of current world of uh, men's advice and rich guy uh, existence online. More people stay poor because of their egos than get rich off them. Yeah. At the moment, it seems like egos are being valorized on the internet, especially among men's advice. Yeah. How is it that more people stay poor because of their egos than get rich off them? If there's a bunch of examples of people with seemingly big egos that also have money. I think that's, um, what's the fallacy? Um, whatever the, whatever the cognitive fallacy for what's in front of your eyes. I think there are far more people. Was it? Availability bias. There you go. Um, I think there are far more people who are successful and, and significantly more successful than the people who are visible on content who, and I would say many of those people aren't actually that successful. And so if we're looking at the objective measure of success as like net worth, just for, just for the sake of this conversation, there are far more people who are rich and anonymous than there are people who flaunt their Lamborghinis that they rented for a day. Now there, I mean, if you really think about the influencer world of business, there are not that many guys who actually like are really in the game. Like most of those guys sell something from their platform about building a platform. Like that's, that's 90, not even 95. It's probably like 98, 99%. And so there's only like a very small select. And, and to be fair, those guys are all pretty humble. 
like you look at the Gary's, you look at the the Andy's, you look at the um, Tom Billy, like uh, these Ed Milet, like the, you know, like the guys who have become you know in, in the business space, like they're not particularly egotistical guys, and it's usually because they know what hard feels like. And they know what it's like to be inadequate over and over and over again, because you only can be inadequate if you go to another level. If you feel amazing, it's because you haven't moved up. Does that mean that if somebody wants to be successful and they feel like they've still got an ego, that they need to do some work on dissolving that? I think they just need to do harder things. Like you need to fight harder opponents. Like because the only way you can, this little pool. The only way you can maintain an ego is by believing that you're a big fish in a little pond. Right. Or a delusion. big fish in whatever size pond you think it is. And if you're a big fish, you're not in a big enough pond. It's totally delusion. It's hard to comprehend, like Bezos, if you've heard any of his interviews, seems like a very humble guy, but like you could have a hundred billionaires in a room and he is worth the same amount as them. And then if you had each one of those billionaires is a thousand millionaires, he's still worth the same, the same amount as 1,000, 100, whatever, a hundred thousand millionaires and then him. So like there's just levels to it. And I think the moment you get to ego is the moment you stop growing because you feel like you beat the level, but you just keep repeating the level rather than moving up because there is a harder boss and they just haven't faced it yet. I suppose it's an easy way, you know, if you were uh, going to a karate class, uh, but you decided instead of going to the adult one to go to the one that's under 11s and you're going to kick the fuck out of all of these. Yeah. And you video it and you're like, look at me. And it just happens to be that they're the same size as you. And like, just imagine they're like dumb on the inside, but they're, you know, adult (laughs) size and you're kicking the shit out of them. It's like, yeah, do it to Jones. Right. Like not going to happen. And so like, I'm going to say this. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm just trying to say this the way that I take this the way I mean it. I get comments from people who are like, love your humility, Alex. And like, I don't think I'm that humble of a guy being real, at least internally in my own head. But I am reminded daily of my inadequacy on the business game. Because like right now we've moved up a level in terms of like, now we're, ma- now we're doing deals. Now we're investing in companies. We're taking on big risk. We're writing checks, like the, uh, another level of the game than just owning one, not to say that owning one business and growing it is not hard. It absolutely is a different kind of hard, but like I'm getting into this game and I'm absolutely the small fish. Like Warren Buffett made $90 billion on the trade he made in Apple in 2020. One move, right? And so I'm like, I am entering into a game. Like, how could I say that I'm good? Like, even if I was exceptional, it's still going to take 20 years to prove it. So like, I can't say anything. And by that point, I'll probably have other guys who are, you know, who are fucking Titans at that point to remind me of the fact that I'm not as good as them. So in your estimation, is the presence of an ego something which artificially limits the size of the vision of how high you want to climb. Yeah. A hundred percent. And right. because it's, you cannot, you can't both say that you are, you cannot admit deficits and say you're awesome at the same time. In my opinion, like I can't say like, I suck at all these things and then also be like, I'm the best. Like you can't do it. You either like you suck at all these things. And it's, I think it's the Dunning Kruger effect, which is like the more you, the more you learn about something, the more, like, the more you realize you don't know. And so I think that if you have a tiny, tiny subset of things that you were studying and a tiny subset of people you're comparing yourself to, then it, it's really easy to feel awesome about yourself. But if you compare yourself to, I mean, I compare myself every day to Warren Buffett and like, he's my app, him and Munger are like my heroes, mostly because the way they lived life and what they like, just everything about the way they lived is something that I just love. And like, I have net, uh, Buffett's net worth by age tracked and I have like mine tracked and I'm like, all right, just gotta stay above that line. And then like, like, he's got a big line. At the moment? I am right now, but like I had a, you know, like his world was different. Yeah. Like I got Warren didn't have Warren to learn from. Yes. Very interesting. It's, um, I mean, you talk, we spoke about this at the very, very start where you were saying you have the opportunity of using the blueprint that has been laid down by me. Yeah. It's like, if you've got nothing to lose, do, um, do the me thing. Yeah. You know, you have all of the mistakes, all of the failures and all of the successes. And you, there was another one where you said, the rarer you are, the rarer the people are who share your perspective in yeah. this way, the greater your success, the fewer people you can share it with. And I was playing with this quote from Alain de Botton from the School of Life for ages, which was uh, loneliness is a kind of tax you have to pay to atone for a certain complexity of mind. Hmm. And I'm really not sure because since I've been in Austin, the complexity of mind thing, which is that hasn't stopped, but the loneliness changed. Mm -hmm. And I figured that that was a big function of change of environment and maybe like whatever embracing or acceptance of, of what was going on. But Again, is this a byproduct of success that 
a lot of people don't necessarily realize it's a price that's going to be need to be paid. If you want to achieve a ton of success, you end up at this rarefied strata out in the troposphere somewhere. Yeah. And you're like, well, I got like five people that I can talk to that understand what I'm going through at the moment. Yeah. Or another question as well, is that a combination of hubris and self-delusion? Like, is that true? Yeah. Or are there things that the bus driver or the lady that serves you at Whole Foods can actually like relate to you on? So two questions. One is I would probably reject the notion that it's a price overall because like being in, like if you think about it as a mountain, there's less, there's less square footage at the top of the mountain. It just is. There's fewer people there and the air is thinner. It's harder to get there, harder to breathe, right? And you have to adjust to it. You have to acclimate. And the people that are around you, like there are fewer of them, but you could make the argument that they have even more context than anyone else possibly could. And so maybe the, the relationship you have are potentially deeper. Even if they're not, humans don't need that many relationships. So like you just have a smaller pool to choose from, but like most people only have two or three good relationships in their life anyways. And so like you just have a narrower pool that you can make that selection from. And um, I mean, of the people that I have interacted with who are far above that, above me on the mountain, um, that's been their, that's what they've relayed to me. Um, but it's only bad if you think it's a cost. If you're okay with it, because there are plenty of people who are lonely right now and don't have shit. So... And there's, you know, and you already know this, but like the, there's a difference between being lonely and solitude, you know, um, and one is seen as bad. The other is seen as fine or good. So in, in some circles that's seen as self-care. So, like, <laughs> um, uh, so to me, it just means that like, I think your tolerance or your standard for friends raises and I'll share this and hopefully it comes off the right way. I entered communities as I was coming up and was like, wow, everyone here is bigger than me. And then I was able to, through achievement, rise through that. And then I lost context with that group. And so I think there's just more free agency of friendship that happens on your climb up because you're just moving between strata more frequently than it is that if I settled at one of these levels, then I would eventually find all the people at that rung. But if you're constantly on the move up the mountain, then more of that is in transitionary period on the on the climb and it's only a problem if you'd hate it i don't what don't you hate you don't hate the fact that sort of people come and go that some of these yeah. relationships are kind of transient yeah it just doesn't bother me because so i think it's like a should statement which is like one of my big things it's like why should i why does it have to be why must it doesn't must anything it just is that way and that's fine talking about social media we mentioned this earlier on what are your predictions for the next six months to a couple of years in terms of what you think is going to be big, any focuses or any interesting trends that you're noticing at the moment? I will state first off that I'm not a social media expert by any stretch, but just, you know, I think AI is going to be the main driving force behind the future of social media and I don't know how we're going to deal with it. Um, I mean, there's already the deep fakes of Rogan doing entire podcasts with Steve Jobs that are going out there. And the entire thing is both created and recorded with AI. And so I think it'll be really interesting because right now it's still not as good as the best creators, but in a few machine generations, it'll make the best content every time in seconds. And I'm not sure what's going to happen. I think that I know the verification check mark is going to matter more. It'll change in its meaning. Right now it means status. In the future it'll mean real person. Um, so that I'll make that prediction that the verification of bot versus human will become more important in the future. I can make that prediction. Um, and that there will be more AI generated content in the future than there is today. Um, and how we respond to it, I don't know. It's scary to think that what we basically had for the last five years or so since the algorithm started to get really tight is a three-way feedback mechanism from algorithms designing better delivered content to users. Mm -hmm. It also nudges the user's preferences so that they are easier and more predictable to predict. That was that two-way street was something I learned from Stuart Russell and it's fucking amazing. Uh, everybody needs to understand that. It's not just you programming the algorithm, it's the algorithm programming you. And it's one of the reasons that it explains increasing division and extremity. Because yeah. if you are far right or far left or super whatever yeah. or super the other thing, it makes you way easier to predict. And that's a byproduct of any algorithmic optimizing function. 
And then the third element of that is audience capture by the creators because they are the third element of the creation of the content, right? That mm -hmm. they go, hey, how, how well did that perform? Uh, oh, we'll, we'll red meat that a little bit more and a little bit more yeah. and a little bit more. And then you end up on your knees like cooking for the audience, right? <laughs> yeah. The fourth element of this is going to be then you are able to algorithmically create content that understands the back end of the algorithm, that can nudge preferences and can get feedback and all of that. I mean, that to me is, fuck me, if we think that, you know, like the degree of overbearingness that social has on our lives at the moment, like that's a very, very big deal. Well, it could cut out the middleman, the creator being the middleman, and then it just becomes a vertically integrated platform that creates content on its own using AI and just feeds it directly to the audience. That's what I said. As soon as those uh, the AI images of hot girls came out and then chat GPT, you go, look, like OnlyFans, you're no yeah. longer an agency. You're now a tech company. That yeah. should be the move that you make. Every single person should have their own curated wifey girlfriend yeah. online. And that's that's what you, yeah. th that's your thing. Like, And it would be infinitely scalable. You know, like yeah. the perfect dirty talk, completely curated and twiddled to your specific, yeah. whatever it is. Uh, but, that doesn't bode particularly well for how much limbic hijack and freedom people have from social media, because it is only going to become more and more compelling, mm -hmm. which isn't necessarily a good thing. I mean, I, good, bad, no idea. Um, I, I think there'll probably be a little bit of a counter movement um, of people who want to do more things in person. Make social media human again. <laughs> well, you know, an interesting thought experiment that I had, I was like, because we've, we've taken some things and I, I do think AI is going to happen, but like, as in it will continue. Um, but I was like, we accept all technology as inevitable. And I was thinking about this and I was like, has there ever been a technology that humans have created that we were like, nah, we shouldn't do this. And I thought about it. I was like, there is one nuclear bombs. We all were like, I think it's better if we don't, we should just not do this. And everyone just like agreed. We're like, we're not going to do this. And I, I think the, the rate of AI, how disaggregated it is, like will prevent that from happening. But I just thought about that as like, it just, there hasn't been any other technological thing that I've seen besides nuclear bombs that we all together were like, this isn't good for us. Have you seen how g tabletop genetic sequencing machines work? No. This is a really good example of what you're talking about. So the way that pretty much all of them are cloud based, and in order to sequence whatever it is that you're looking to sequence, it sends the the request up to the cloud. And there's three gradings. There's green, amber, and red. And if it's green, you can just do it. No one checks. If there's amber, you have to submit a proposal for what it is, where it's going, BSL level, mm -hmm. et cetera, security, security. And if it's red, you just can't do it. And then presumably someone comes around and goes, excuse me, what the fuck are you doing trying to make smallpox? Yeah. Um, but that, uh, there's been, I think it's th th either two or three times in the history of gene sequencing, there has been a, a moratorium placed globally on this. Everyone's gone. Every fucking machine goes off. Everything. Stop. Yeah. Until we work out what's going on. So there are situations. That's a great example. Like cloning. Humans. As you just yeah. said, as soon as you start to atomize that and disaggregate it and distribute it between enough different actors, yeah. how are you going to be able to control? You know, And, and the, the other thing is, with genetic sequencing, the, the kind of machines that you need, the hardware is complex. Yeah, it's expensive and it's rare, yeah. The hardware is not complex for anybody can right. code. And the reward is? Everything, it's the yeah. world, <laughs> it's the world. It's, right. it's, it's domination, it's money, it's yeah. success, it's all of those things. This is why, I don't know man, like the fucking, the techno optimist thing, ever since I read Superintelligence by Nick Bostrom five or six years ago, I just don't see an AGI future where stuff doesn't get fucked. Uh, I don't know would, uh, whether we get the general bit of AGI, super mm -hmm. AGI is like still up for a big part of debate. But if you end up creating this very strange world in which everyone's limbically hijacked with their own personal news feed of like perfectly. You remember Cambridge Analytica and the um, those scandals around the Hillary Clinton ads? It's like, I know your preferences and we're going to create these perfectly done ads. It's like, okay, I mean, the ads were still created by a human and it was still, you were bucketed into a content with other men of this age with these interests in this area with these voting habits. Imagine if every single news feed, not just post, news feed was perfectly curated to maximize yeah. time on it site. It says, hey, Chris. Like that's the first line of every ad. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But it might just be the same as email. The first time there was personalized email, all of a sudden you, you stop becoming responsive to your own name. Mm. So like, I think they'll, I think they'll, they'll, they'll be push pull um, on that stuff. 
But uh, I'm with you on the AGI long term. You know, as a, as a as a weird thought experiment, if you think about what God looks like in terms of most most definitions, they're like an omniscient, omnipotent being, and I think we're just creating that. Like, what does AI know? It knows everything, right? What can it do? Everything immediately. Like weird. Usually, God would be benevolent. Yes, rolling the benevolence in there. Yeah, yeah. might be good if we yeah. could. It's long. God's long term benevolent. Ah, uh, but short term sometimes mean. Yeah, yeah. you are well, true. It's definitely wrath. Yeah, <laughs> in almost all fates. <laughs> what are you working on now? What can people expect from you next? Uh, hundred dollar leads, one hundred million dollar leads, uh, which is the second book in the hundred million dollar series, um, is going to come out this year. Uh, so that's exciting. Uh, we will we will be done the the edited final draft uh, within seven days. So I'm like, it's been uh, we put in thirty five hundred hours um, together, my editor and I um, combined over the last two years doing it. So it is the first four to six hours of my day every day. Like before I came here, I was editing the book, and that's what I did yesterday, and that's what I did before. Um, so that it could be really really good. And so that's that's the that's the big creative side of me is the is the book it'll be 99 cents there you go i get 33 of that by the way um and then, yes <laughs> yeah right i'm gonna get rich um and then the rest of uh, my life is all about deals it's just uh we've got some really interesting companies that we're investing in um very very pumped on that side um so yeah if you've got a one to ten million dollar ebitda business uh and you would like a growth partner go to acquisition.com and let us know <laughs> dude i really appreciate you i really really enjoyed this today it's been cool to come and see Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Hopefully the audience got what they wanted. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.